Hello artists, welcome back to another video lecture. Uh, this one you will need to make sure that you have the note sheet that goes along with this because there is a lot of background information, much of which is going to be hard to retain just by watching the video. I do recommend you use the note sheet to write down these notes so then when it comes time to quiz time, you will have all of this information right at your disposal. All right, let's get started on the lecture. So just a little bit of background on Photoshop. I, these are things about files, file types that you really should know. It makes it easier to understand Photoshop and how it works and why it does what it does. If you understand a little bit of the tech side of this, the hardest part is going to be resolution and there is a separate video that is a that uh, you will be watching that goes over resolution um, if you need a little bit of help, just because, like I said, resolution is the hardest thing to understand. So what you should know is that Photoshop has actually been around for a really long time. It's been around since the 80s. Uh, actually, earlier versions were even before the 80s, but in 1988, that's when the version of what we know as Adobe Photoshop was created by the Knoll brothers. And when they first did it, it was meant for photographers, not necessarily artists or designers, because what it was doing is it was replacing the dark room, where artists who would use film in their cameras would go and develop the negatives. Digital photographers needed a place to go to rework their images, to fix lighting and any other imperfections that normally would be done in the dark room. So that's why it's called Photoshop, okay? You're, you're shopping your photos. It is much better at reworking or working with already created photos. So again, it's great at editing photos or combining photos uh, or working with photos. What it's not great at is creating custom graphics like this. I'm not saying you can't in Photoshop, you can, but it's gonna be harder and there's better software. And those of you who are in the print shop class know that this looks much more like something you would do in print shop, um, which is graphic design. So Illustrator is much better for uh, making graphics um, from scratch. The way that Photoshop works is it works uh, as a raster program. Raster means the way it creates the files is through tiny little pixels, little, little tiny squares. Those squares are called pixels. The more pixels you have in an image, the better the quality. The fewer you have, the poorer the quality. And we've all seen this. We've all downloaded images from the internet. They look great on the screen and then we go to use them and all of a sudden they suddenly pixelate. They look terrible. It's because of the raster format of the file and the resolution that it has. And again, we're going to go into resolution here in just a little bit. The, there is a different type of image file. So if Photoshop uses rasters, which is tiny little boxes, so it has some limitations. Um, the other type is called vector, and that's what Illustrator does. And the nice thing about vector is because you're not working with a photograph, uh, you're instead working with a computer cr to create the content. Um, it uses mathematical algorithms using an XY axis. So instead of a limited number of boxes or pixels, you can tell it I want it to go from here to here on an XY axis doesn't matter how big the XY axis is. So I could make an image that's this big, but still blow it up to billboard size, and it's not going to distort or uh, the quality isn't going to degrade at all because it's a mathematical algorithm that's just going to, the computer is going to refigure it. It can't do that with a photograph that already has a predetermined number of pixels. That's all it has to work with. In Photoshop, we're going to be working with three different basic file types. Um, there are more, so these are just the format in which the file is saved. The most common is probably still JPEG, although that is starting to change. Um, that's a universal file type. What that means is a JPEG can open on almost every single type of software. You can use it with websites, and you can put it on the internet, and you can put it on social media, and you can attach it to emails, and you can open it in Photoshop. You can open it in Snapseed. You can open it in Google Paint. Um, you can send it to Walgreens for printing. So JPEGs are universal, and that came about because of a bunch of photographers who were using Photoshop and all these other photo editing uh, apps and software and they're like nothing is working together like I'll work on something and send it to Joe and Joe can't open it and it's it's a big old mess so they're like we need a way to save files that it doesn't even matter if you're working on a PC or an Apple it's all gonna open um, so JPEG just for a little bit of Jeopardy trivia stands for joint photographers photographers expert group that's a mouthful joint 
photographers. Did I say photographers? Oh my gosh. Joint Photographers Expert Group. That's what that stands for. Uh, the other type of file type that you're most commonly going to be seeing is the PSD file, and that is Photoshop's native format um, that only opens in Photoshop and it can only be used in other Adobe software. So like you can insert a Photoshop file into an Illustrator file or you can use it within um, the DreamWorks program, but those are all Adobe softwares and they're part of that larger suite. Um, the nice thing about a PSD native format is I can use a PC here at Rock Falls High School and I can use Photoshop and I can work on the file. I can also share the file and then open it on an Apple, say at WACC or at home or wherever else, as long as I have Photoshop, it's going to open and you will have no problems with compatibility. The problem with Photoshop files is you can only open it in Photoshop and you can only use it in Adobe. Um, it doesn't open um, in Word. You can't insert a, a PSD file and, and have it viewable in a Google Doc. Um, it's not universal. The other thing is it's really large. Um, when you save something as a JPEG, and you will convert your PSDs at the end of the semester to a JPEG, what it does is it, it kind of compresses the file. It makes it a little bit smaller, a little bit more manageable uh, for sharing and uploading. PSLs or PSD files are really big because they have a lot of information in them. All right, but you want to keep them as a PSD until I tell you to flatten them down as a JPEG or convert them to a JPEG. The last type of file type that you might um, come in contact with, and it's becoming um, more popular within um, graphic circles, is that what's called a PNG file. It's essentially the same exact thing as a JPEG, so it's universal. You can use it in everything. It's a fairly small. Um, the difference is it supports what's called transparency. So. The way a JPEG works is if you look at it on your screen, it looks like maybe it's a cutout of like a heart or an app or something, and it's clear around, right? But then you take that and you put it on a Google slide or you send it somewhere else. All of a sudden, when you put it in there, it's going to give you like a white square around it. Um, JPEGs don't support transparency. So what it's going to do is it's when you convert it to a JPEG, it's automatically going to put wherever it was clear. So in other words, wherever there's no pixels, it's going to put a white pixel or a white square in there versus a PNG where it's going to leave it clear. Um, so it, it supports that transparency that you create in, in Photoshop. So know that they're going to pretty much look and work the same way in Photoshop, but if you're going to want to make something so it has an irregular edge and it's not in a box, um, like say logo design or something like that, you're going to want to make sure it's a PNG format. So again, here is uh, the long form of what I just went over. So JPEG, it's your universal format. It is raster, so it's tiny little boxes, and it's a compression file. Okay, it makes it much smaller. And so some of you will even see that when you go to save something, you might get that maximum capability box that pops up when you're doing PSD files because it's going to say, hey, this is a monster file. Are you sure you're going to want to do this? If you're saving as JPEG, you're gonna, not going to get that. You're not going to get that prompt versus when you save as a PSD. When you go to file, save as at the first time, you're going to get that alert box that says, hey, you're converting to PSD. This is going to be a bigger file. Are you okay with that? So again, not universal um, in its Photoshop's native format. And you want to keep it in that until you're completely done. And then there's your PNG. So resolution is the number of squares that's within an image. So it has to do with, there's a little bit of math involved, um, but it has to do with how many of those pixels there are. And your camera is what determines that. So whatever your camera is set at, it's not Photoshop. It's, you can artificially increase it, but it's not really increasing it. It's the camera. So most of our phones are set at a 72 resolution. Um, some good high-end cameras are going to be set at like 200. But 72 is kind of a lower resolution. We'll talk about that in a second, okay? But just know that the higher the resolution, it means the more the pixels. You have the slide presentation. It's linked with this video here. If you want, again, there's another little video here you can watch. If you are kind of into math and you, you geek out on this stuff, watch this. This is a great example that explains the math behind it. Um, you can watch that. I will have an, a quick video on resolution you're going to watch after this video as well. Hello, welcome, welcome to, to Two Minute Minutes Design. Design. I'm Dage, and today we're going to... He does a good job. All right. Next up is what's called PPI. 
So if I ask what your PPI is or your DPI, it just means pixels per inch. And if you look at it, when you go into Photoshop, and I'm going to show you how to open up this dialog box here, this is how you know what your PPI is. So it says how many pixels are for every inch. Um, and images have different sizes. Okay, you could have a two by two inch image or you could have a 24 by 72 inch image. Um, both of them having the same exact PPI. They're just made up of more or less pixels. Okay, and again, there's another video here. Um, this is the one that you're gonna watch, so don't worry about watching it here in the slide. I have it attached in the separate video for you in Google Classroom along with this video, okay? Color modes are not file types. Um, they are important to understand though. There are three file types, or sorry, three color modes. Color modes are how the computer or how the printer is going to see and receive color data. Okay, so when you save your file, whether it's a JPEG or PSD, it doesn't matter, you can use one of these three different ways of saving your color. RGB, which is red, green, and blue, CMYK, which is cyan, blue, magenta, yellow, and black, and then obviously grayscale. Okay, there's also bitmap, but we're not going to use bitmap at all. So here's what you need to know about these. So RGB mode is the color that your monitor displays, uh, or excuse me, it's the way your monitor displays color and it does it through light. It's an additive process. So really all it's doing is the monitor. It's flashing either red, green, or blue light at you. Okay, so the pixels are either red light, green light, blue light. And you can see how they overlap. If it's, it's putting red and blue in the same pixel, you're gonna get purple. If it's putting blue and green, you're gonna, or you're gonna get a, like a cyan blue. If you do all three colors, ironically, you're actually gonna get white. Um, that's the visible, if you've ever seen a rainbow, that's white light. White light, when you break it down into the different uh, color spectrum, it, that's where your Roy G. Biv comes in, okay? So a computer monitor only uses red light, green light, and blue light to show us all our colors. That's important to know because it limits us a little bit, okay? Our printers are a different color mode. They can't print with light, okay? They're printing with ink. It's actually the opposite. It's a subtractive process. So it's removing the light waves. It's kind of hard to explain. So instead of using red, blue, and green, it's going to use cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And if you've ever opened up your printers, you will see those are the different cartridges. And the way they mix, when they mix all of them together, you're not gonna get white, you're gonna get black, you're gonna get the opposite. Why you need to know this is because if you send a file, that's an RGB file, and you send it to a printer, they're using two different recipe books, basically. So if you send a certain shade of blue, your monitor's using this recipe to get that blue, your printer's using this recipe because they don't have the same ingredients, and that's where you it doesn't exactly look the same when you sent it to a printer. So that's the first thing you should know about that. The other thing is that you should know that some of the Photoshop filters, those fun groovy filters that we're learning about, they won't work if your file is in CMYK mode, if it's in printer mode. Okay, so just know that if you go to that filter gallery and they're grayed out and it won't let you click at them, you'll have to convert the mode um, in order to do that. All right, and if you help, ever need help with that, let me know. All right. Also, similarly, if you are working with an image and you go to paint and like you have no color available, you can't choose red, you can't, you're, even if you choose red and you paint, it paints it in gray, you're probably in grayscale mode. So what grayscale mode is, is in your image, you are taking out red, green, and blue. You are only using either all light, which is white light, or no light. Okay, so it's, it's, do, it's all or none. And so it's either white or black, and then you get all of those shades of gray, um, up to 256 different tones. You don't wanna do black and white, you wanna do grayscale, because it's gonna give you more depth in a grayscale image versus a straight up black and white, because you can have some percentages of white. So in other words, like let's say this is a pixel, it's full on, okay? It's all white. This, the pixel's completely shut off, right? Basically, there's no light coming through. This, I'm kind of relating to pixels. This is where it's like letting a little light through. So you get a really nice depth versus just a bitmap, which is 100% white or 100% black. That's a bitmap is basically looks grayscale, but it's just lower quality. 
this is how you change your color mode. So like I said, if something isn't working, if your filters aren't working, you're going to want to switch it from CMYK. You're just going to have to click on RGB and you do that by going to image mode CMYK. And again, I sh you'll probably forget, call me over, I'll help you, or you'll get out this note sheet that you're writing this down with right now and you'll switch that, okay? Don't worry about your bits. We're not gonna get that techie. Just worry about these three modes, note shift, grayscale, RGB, and CMYK. I wouldn't worry too much about switching back and forth to CMYK. Um, I would just leave pretty much everything in RGB. If I'm gonna print it for an art show, I will manually convert that to CMYK just so it prints a little bit better, okay? So in the video lesson, you should have gone over these eight steps and I took you through them. Those are the basic eight steps you're gonna wanna follow step by step by step. So when you are doing the project, which there's another video that shows you what the expectations are for the project, once you get through all these video lessons, you're still probably gonna wanna pull up that slide and make sure, am I doing those steps? And am I doing them in the correct order? Cause it's gonna take you through color correction, scale and cropping levels, removing things, all of that groovy, important stuff, okay? So make sure that you continue on. So after this, after this lesson, I want you to go ahead and go on to the next lessons and go on in this order. So you should have already completed the eight steps. That's the basics. Now I want you to go on to the really fun stuff, which is 3A cloning and 3B cloning. That's where you're gonna start removing. That's the stuff that you didn't do in the eight steps. From there, um, then I have a couple just basic like little things that you need to know about, um, things that might come up in retouching that aren't part of the basic eight step, which is red eye removal. And then we get really fancy and I want you to do the portrait retouching, which is how to take those eight steps and use them specifically, specifically for retouching portraiture. Okay, so like if you were a portrait photographer like Persona or somebody else, they would know how to do this. They would be using Photoshop specifically in this way to retouch uh, photos, not landscapes or anything else, but just photos. And then if you have time, I strongly suggest you might want to check out this depth of field one and then another one called lighting effects. I'm not going to make it mandatory, but for those of you guys who are like sailing through this, and you're like, dude, this is uh, awesome. I want to learn more. I'm ready. Give me something else. Sure. You know, give me what you got. Go ahead and find these videos. They're in the YouTube channel in my playlist under computer graphics. If you want to, again, optional, not giving you extra credit, just you'll just go up a little bit notch in my favorites list, that's all. Okay, so this is what you're gonna be doing after you get through all those videos. You're gonna be retouching an image. You must bring in a photo, um, an older photo that has to be in color. Now it doesn't have to be super old, like this one's old, old, but um, a photograph that you have. You can bring in a printed photo, um, if you bring in a printed photo, you'll have to give it to me because I'll scan it in. However, you can use a digital photo as well, that's fine. It does need to be a color picture though. It can't be a black and white photo for this. Once you're done with the project, if mom or dad or grandma has given you a black and white photo they want you to retouch, that's fine, but do this project first and then with your free time, you can retouch a black and white photo, okay? And then after that, we're gonna do some fun stuff. You're gonna have some more videos. This is a big unit. This, in fact, this is our biggest unit other than the, um, digital painting and drawing one you're gonna do you're gonna use those same exact things you've just learned when the eight steps the cloning all of that but then we're gonna add on some other additional things that are more creative like photo adjustments you're retouching it's it's not all of that it's not very creative it's not very fun it's kind of cool but not real fun we're gonna get into some more artistic things we're gonna get into what I, I affectionately call the Instagram project basically we're gonna learn how to do what Instagram does in Photoshop but we're gonna do it better all right, um, so we're gonna dig in deeper into filters. We're gonna look at some lighting effects, color, um, something called color lookup, and then um, black and white spot color, all these groovy and cool things, okay? So when you're done with this video, I want you to stop and watch that additional video that I've posted on resolution. It's five minutes, it's much, much shorter than this one. And then go back from there. Once your notes are done, go ahead and start on 3A cloning. That's your next step and work through this list. Good job, artists.